Hi, I'm Bill Lishman. In 1988, I learned to fly with a flock of 12 Canada geese. And out of that grew an idea that perhaps we could show endangered species new migration routes. It's been an amazing adventure and a learning experience for everybody. So share with me now the Odyssey of the Ultra Geese. The story of the Ultra Geese migration experiments really begins in 1990. Dr. William Sladen lives with his wife Jocelyn in this house called Clifton in Northern Virginia. And aside from being a medical doctor, he has spent his life studying birds from penguins to trumpeter swans. It was Dr. Sladen that pointed out that large waterfowl, ducks, geese, swans and cranes, learn the migration routes from previous generations. And if this continuum is broken for some reason, then they fail to migrate. He and the renowned Canadian naturalist William Carrick, who had coached me initially in imprinting techniques, believed that there was a chance to restore the trumpeter swan population in eastern North America if they could be shown a migration route, perhaps by ultralight aircraft. Dr. Slayton helped by providing swan eggs and encouragement. Bill Carrick hatched them in his incubator. The swans were a new experience. Once hatched, they were slow to learn compared to the geese. The trumpeter swan is the largest flying bird in the world, and they have difficulty taking off from land. They mostly fly from water. Our idea was to raise them on a pond and get them used to a mock-up aircraft similar to uh, this aircraft that I was learning to fly from water. The first part of the plan in 1990 was to raise a small flock of swans and attempt to get them to fly with an aircraft and perhaps lead them on some cross-country flights. The second part was to raise a flock of Canada geese and if we could get permits, lead them on a migration from Ontario to Dr. Sladen's in Virginia. It is really interesting to experience the difference between the two species, for while the geese are always active and eager to follow, the swans seem lazy and slow to learn. Eventually they are following our mock-up aircraft, and as they grow, they take on a wonderful grace and character, and we understand why they are the birds of royalty. Just as everyone was becoming attached to the swans and their individual personalities begin to appear, disaster struck. We had not taken into account that not all officials were in favor of our plans. After all, we were both outside the scientific and bureaucratic communities and the permits did not cover the scope of the experiment. We got caught in a political and bureaucratic crossfire, and the swans became the pawns of the debate. They were confiscated. Our young swans, treated like aliens from an enemy camp, were taken to a secret facility, and an attempt was made to render them flightless. Son Aaron and I followed the officials, but all efforts to get them back were blocked. We were in a state of shock. With just the geese left, I put all my efforts into their well-being and enjoyed their world of discovery. The flock is well imprinted and within three weeks I'm again sharing their three-dimensional freedom and reliving the wonders I first experienced in 1988. I receive a terse letter from the Wildlife Bureaucratic Service claiming that the permits issued to fly the geese was an error, a clerical error. Using an obscure and outdated law, they revoked my permit to keep the birds and I am instructed to turn them over to an aviculturist and render them flightless. The birds are grounded eventually and sent to live in Stalag Goose. We had been thwarted by an overzealous wildlife bureaucracy and it looked like the project was grounded for good. But we got letters of encouragement from all over, so by 1993 Dr. Sladen and I decided to try again, only it would be a simple project with a few geese led from Ontario to Virginia. Dr. Sladen called them the ultra geese. With the wildlife bureaucracies poised to stop the experiment at the slightest infraction, we would only have one chance and it would have to succeed. It could not depend on one pilot. It could not depend on one plane. I could not do it single-handedly. The project needed a second dedicated person. The best candidate was Joe Duff. He kept his aircraft at my strip and we had flown together numerous times during the previous decade. He is an excellent pilot 
and related to birds well. Just walk right up to her. With permit in hand, we were soon collecting eggs. Now, while the Easy Riser had worked well in my initial experiment in 1988, I believed there were more suitable craft that would lend themselves to the project. The problem was there was no production aircraft that had the right speed range nor had the endurance that we would require. We liked the idea of using a trike, a craft that had gained a lot of popularity in Europe. With a trike idea in mind, I felt we could more closely resemble a parent bird and there would be more likelihood of success. I made a model. Then I met with Gerard Thiveneau, the designer of one of the best trike wings in the world. And as you can see, he wondered if there was any sanity involved in what we were doing. <laughs> After some slow flight trials with a new Cosmos wing, we took the gamble, and having no other choice, we ordered one. We actually ordered two. On our return to Canada, we found our new group of flying partners beginning to experience the world. Daughter Carmen helps with the initial imprinting as soon as they have struggled out of the shell. Watching them run at this early age, it's possible to visualize the evolution from the dinosaur 100 million years ago. Playing Goose Parent and spending the time with them is an important part of imprinting process. And while doing so, I work on a scale model of the goose head that I propose to add to the wing when it derives from the Cosmos factory. By the first week of June, the wing has not arrived from France. So I create this jury-rigged contraption with the hope that it will be close enough resemblance to the real aircraft once it arrives. A number of unanswered questions nag at us particularly safe stopover points on the way to Virginia. Joe outlines our proposed route. We really believe it's important to follow traditional migration routes, but that means the first leg of our trip takes us right across Lake Ontario. It's about 40 miles wide at its midpoint, so we're up there for about an hour. After that, it's clear sailing through the state of New York until we hit the mountains in Pennsylvania. Once over that hump, it's a clear run down through Maryland into Virginia, and we'll eventually end up at the Early Center, about 50 miles outside of D.C. With good goose habitat in mind, first we considered landing at state parks. However, to avoid yet another layer of bureaucracy, we opted to seek out a chain of private grass airstrips. North America is dotted with these little strips, owned by unique individuals who all share a common love for the adventure of flying or anything aviation oriented. <laughs> Traveling highways and byways over a week, we found eight sites that were close to our proposed route. The road trip ends at Airlie, where we are welcomed by Dr. Sladen and given a tour of the beautiful 3,000 acre facility. Once the aircraft arrives, we have to work feverishly to mate the engine to the airframe and assemble the various parts. So with time at a premium, my big idea to create a head and tail and paint the aircraft like a goose is abandoned. Our plan is to create an aircraft using a lighter, less powerful engine. It will have the proper speed, range, and endurance, and most of all, the reliability to fly to Virginia with only a few stops. First are a few taxi tests without the wing. We are dismayed to find that we had erred in our imprinting techniques. We had mistakenly thought that bigger was better. A goose family in the wild is comprised of about five goslings and two parents. We made the mistake of putting all the goslings in one large group. The goslings, although initially imprinted on Joe and myself, became more imprinted on each other while they were away. They became like street kids. Trying to get them to follow was very frustrating. With the wing on, I'm ready for the first test flight. It's an untried combination and, as always, nerve-wracking. So we move it to a longer airstrip where there is more margin for error. Holding my breath, I get it in the air, and I'm relieved to find it flies fine.
maybe the landing's not that great. Concerned for the bird's safety, we create a guard that will keep them clear of the propeller. One of the requirements for the experiment was to make sure that the birds are healthy. So we call on the expertise of avian vet Dr. Mike Taylor, who gives them each a checkup. While my airstrip had worked well previously, it is in a valley and surrounded by trees. Trying to do the initial flights with the geese in an aircraft that has only a few hours on it didn't seem prudent. In the interest of a higher safety factor, we moved most of the birds to Willie Castile's 3,000 foot airstrip a few miles to the north. The birds didn't like the move, nor did some of the locals, for the initial flock is released from their pen in the middle of the night, and it's only with the help of the community that we're able to retrieve a few of them. Joe and Aaron run their legs off trying to instill the basic idea in the birds which are just over 10 weeks of age, but they really don't want to fly with us. For two solid weeks we work at it. The delay in introducing them to the sights and sounds of the real aircraft, then keeping the birds together in too large a flock and moving them to the new location have compounded our imprinting problems. They are confused birds. And it seems they have little inclination to follow the aircraft. They have a mind of their own, and instead of staying with the airplane or returning to their base, they fly where they wish and they land where they want. In farm ponds, at cottages, on Lake Skewgog, we are constantly having to round them up and bring them back. It's frustrating dawn to dusk work. Every day we are on the verge of giving up. It's part of the adventure we could have done without. At this point, Dr. Sladen arrives from Virginia and fits the bird with the government leg bands. We all agree we'll give the project a week. If the birds don't fly, we'll cancel it. But then one bird starts to fly with the plane. We keep one flock at the home airstrip at Purple Hill, but they too prove difficult, and while they will take off with me, they quickly circle back and land on their own. Frustrated not to be outdone by the wayward geese, I demonstrate that I can land as short as they do, only I need a little shrubbery to help me stop the rollout. Many days we have to sit and wait for the wind to drop. Taking the lead from the one goose that follows the plane, a number of the birds eventually get the idea and they begin to fly with us. Morning and evening, whenever the weather allows, we fly, flight after flight with them. Of the 36 birds that we started with, we eventually just get 18 birds that will fly with us consistently. And we gradually increase our flight times. By mid-September, they are up to flying well over an hour and it's time to try our first cross-country flight. We have never before attempted a landing with them at any place other than home. Our first cross-country flight is 30 miles to the north, and the date happens to coincide with the first day of goose hunting season in Ontario. When we arrive at our destination, the geese show little inclination to land. They even attempt to head home. I get on the ground and I call them till I'm hoarse. Joe stays in the air and keeps rounding them up and bringing them back. The winds pick up and he has a constant struggle to maintain control of the craft. Finally, after numerous low passes, the birds touch down. We count them. There's an extra bird. A wild one has joined the flock. And then on our return flight two days later, it drops out. On windy days, I write a detailed plan to prepare for the lake crossing and our southerly migration. 
Joe and I reenact a scene from Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. Well, not quite. But we do test our insulated floater suits. There are hundreds of what ifs. October 10th is our planned date of departure. On the 9th, the ground crew departs to set up base camp at French Downey's airfield on the south side of Lake Ontario. The next morning, after a sleepless night of anticipation, we're ready. We're full of nervous anticipation. The aircraft are warm in that cold gray dawn. It appears that everything is going to plan. A few miles away, Clark Muirhead takes off in his amphib to play guardian angel to us and keep watch as we cross over the big lake. The cloud bank over the lake looks ominous. Clark, out in front in the amphib, contacts us and assures us the weather ahead is fine. Our concerns all summer have been about the effects of this huge body of water on the geese. Will they tire halfway over and land on the lake? In many ways, this is our hour of truth. With a slight tailwind, our ground speed is picked up to 35 miles per hour. Our fears of crossing the lake diminish in unison with the miles covered. Jim Bishop in the safety boat is able to stay beneath us the whole route across. Our actual lake crossing takes only an hour and goes without a hitch. The geese stick to us like glue and our lake crossing fears vanish like a wisp of smoke. It certainly is more comfortable once we cross the coastline and are again over land. To the smells of wood smoke and fresh spread manure, we cruise southeastward across the morning mists of New York State. Meanwhile, the Downies and the neighbors have turned out about a hundred strong to welcome this rather strange airborne Canadian invasion. I land first, and Joe keeps up with the birds, who show their usual caution at landing at strange spots. The geese and Joe disappear over the horizon for a moment and we hear gunshots. What a relief when they appear again. Oh, I'm starting to worry. <laughs> To my surprise, they come in for a landing, passing right over me, and land center stage in front of the crowd. We have prearranged for immigration and customs clearance, and Carla Hengiger from the U.S. Immigration welcomes us officially to U.S. soil. Next morning, we consider taking off but the fog at our next destination keeps us on the ground. Well, the then winds pick up and we wait for three days while 40 mile an hour winds gradually subside. And on Saturday morning, the geese once again farm up with us and we take a southeasterly heading out across toward Pennsylvania. We settle down to revel in the beauty of it all as we progress across the rolling hills and the mature farm communities of New York State. The winds are favorable and it's easy flying. The mountains of Pennsylvania lie ahead. At a safe altitude over the Appalachian, the Apollo satellite navigation units keep us on track. We make several stops. One here is unscheduled. Meanwhile, Dr. Sladen waits us in Virginia. A high-pressure system keeps flying conditions near perfect as we pass from Pennsylvania through a bit of Maryland and then into Virginia. In just four stops in as many days. At 5.30, October 23rd, we're overhead early. Dr. Sladen and a film crew awaits us. The afternoon light is perfect, the air is absolutely still, and the whole scene is surreal. It is a magical, crystal clear evening. The tired and thirsty geese land without hesitation. We are greeted by Dr. Sladen and we strip off our outer flight gear. There's a large welcoming committee. All 18 birds have made it. The flight has been a wonder to us all. We have flown south with the birds and a dream has been realized. Friends and strangers alike congratulate the team. 
who recount the details of the flight many times. The geese are given a fine home at Airlie, and because it is goose hunting season, they are kept penned. And eventually, when hunting season closes, they are released to be free birds. And on several occasions, either Joe and I return and go flying with them. It is an extremely cold winter, and unfortunately, two birds do not survive. The big question was, could they, after being shown the way once, find their way back to Purple Hill? In April, we traveled by road back to Airlie, only to find that our 16 birds have departed, but we're not sure where to. We search for them on the route back, then halfway through New York State, we get a call. They are back home at Purple Hill. Needless to say, we're elated, and we rush home to greet them. Our whole community is caught up in the success of it all, and Joe and I are given a hero's welcome. The project had been a success, and we received accolades from around the world. But many were still not sure that what we had learned would apply to the endangered species. We needed to try the experiment again with twice as many birds and take them twice as far. This time, acquiring a permit is a little easier. So Joe and son Jordy set out on the quest for eggs. That's Jordy in the lead, looking like a courier de bois. This year, Joe and I step back from the initial imprinting, and Jordy plays the role of parent goose. Soon he'll be joined by biology student Kirk Goolsby from Dr. Sladen's camp. The two will work as a team to raise the birds. We selected last year worked really well, so we're going to repeat most of that down to Virginia. Lake Ontario is still there, and so are the mountains in Pennsylvania, but once we reach Virginia, we'll lay over for a few days. Then we're going to head south again, but down through North Carolina, we have to cross the Great PD Swamp, which is a real problem, down into South Carolina, and eventually end up at the Tomiaki Center on Cat Island, just south of Georgetown. We also change our base of operation to a sod farm a few miles from Purple Hill. With its wide expanse of turf, it affords a far greater safety. We have learned from our mistakes in 93. This year, everything works well, and by mid-July, 36 birds are on the wing with us. Daily practice sessions give us a chance to once again study the flight characteristics of the birds. This bird, flying just above in front of the wing, is able to take advantage of the pressure wave over the leading edge, and can almost glide with little effort. When it loses the position and drops down into normal air, it has to speed up its wing beat considerably in order to keep up with the aircraft. Some shots here are slowed down electronically to allow us to observe more clearly the poetry of the total bird. It is always amazing to me how steady the head stays while all else is in fluid motion. here again at normal speed. This shot again slowed a little gives us an insight on how the long primary feathers separate and twist, imparting a propulsive thrust on both up and down strokes. The sod farm location has worked well. There are no losses, just one mishap. A gosling has run over in the early taxiing practice. There's no major injury to the goose, just a temporary limp, which prompted Kirk to name him Igor. Later, Igor became a favorite and assumes a leadership role in the flock. October soon arrives, 
and we were southward bound across the lake, again repeating the scenario of the previous year, only with double the entourage of geese. Also doubled are the number of people waiting for us at Frenchie Downies. We really have a warm feeling landing here again to such a welcoming committee of friendly people. And this year the geese do not hesitate and land perfectly to the joy of the crowd. Across the shore, the south shore of the lake at about 30 feet. Go, oh, beautiful. <laughs> Just down the treetops. Yeah. Uh -huh. You it's were funny. following them, or they were they no, were fo following us? <laughs> the, the problem is, there's a couple of birds that don't like the wing. So when they're leading, they're down like this. Ah. And then of course you go down, and they go down. Yeah. So I try to do this. Whoop. That screws them all up. Ah. I don't know how much longer I'm going to be able to do this. <laughs> For the past 40 years, Frenchy Downey has been building a home-built aircraft called a Pete Bull Air Camper. It is powered by a 1929 Model A Ford engine. Over the years, Frenchy has suffered a great deal of derision from his friends as to the possibility of it ever getting off the ground. In August of 94, nearly half a century after he bought the plans, he got an airborne. At daybreak, after a fine northern New York potluck dinner thrown for us by the Gaines Valley Flying Club, we wheel the aircraft out and once again we are winging south with our 36 charges, Igor flying right close to the cockpit. These birds fly quite differently than last year's flock. While they follow well, trying to get them to altitude is a constant struggle and most of our flights is on very low altitude. Across New York's answer to the Grand Canyon, stopping by the airstrips of Carl Perry south of Mount Morris, then an overnight at the Townsend family at Jolantra Field near Bath. It is at Bath we meet Marilyn Abbey, a teacher and her husband from the village of Addison, New York. They persuade us to veer a couple of miles off course and lead the flock over to school. It lies in this mist shrouded valley ahead, and as we pass above, 800 young students are waving at us. Crossing into Pennsylvania, we land at the beautiful airstrip of Roy and Betty Hughes. Yeah. So you try to come to her each year? At every stop, biology student Kirk Goolsby keeps track of the details. Onward over the Appalachians, we skim along a scant few hundred feet above the ridges of the most mountainous region of our trip. It gives me a great thrill, a sense of connection with history reaches back 250 million years. These are the oldest mountains in North America, stretching from Georgia in the south to Newfoundland in the north. Their mellow forms, shaped by the sandpaper of time, have the feel of well-worn wood. I can't help but think how in our two frail aircraft we are the first humans to share this marvelous flight. A tradition that has endured season after season since long before man ever existed. At each stop, a count is taken. 
birds are fed and watered. Then a shocking surprise. We've lost Igor. And then with the weather system approaching, it's pointless to backtrack and search for him. Sadly, we must press on. The ridges get lower and lower. And after a stop at the airstrip of John and Liz Brown, we find ourselves cruising over the rolling farmland near Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, where little over a century ago, the major battles of the American Civil War were played out. I think about my great-great-grandfather, Captain Bobby Darden of the Virginia Artillery, who somewhere down there long ago took a mini ball in his forearm in one of those horrific battles. Riding the lift created by a slight wind over the easterly ridge of the Appalachians, we pass over a corner of Maryland to the east of Camp David. And then at Point of Rocks, where the Potomac River parts the ridge, we swing a little west into Virginia and start our final stretch for Airlie. The birds, tired now after their long flight, keep slipping down to fly at treetop level. It's not the safest for us, but it does afford us a magnificent tour of a few of Virginia's wealth of beautiful homes. Crossing Route 66, just north of Airlie, we're hit by severe turbulence. It's a strange anomaly in the weather pattern. The air smooths out by the time we're over Airlie Center with its manicured landscape. Flying a circuit, we pass over International House and set up for a touchdown at the specially prepared airstrip at Ravens Hollow. Jordy and Kirk, who have arrived ahead of us, call the birds in for a perfect landing. The geese are shepherded into a specially prepared pen, and in the days to follow, they are sexed, weighed, and fitted with identifying neckbands. A week later, good news, Igor is located in Lock Haven, Pennsylvania by Gail and Bill Hunter. They generously truck him 200 miles to Airlie where he is returned to the flock. <laughs> but a strange thing happens. The once proud leader of the flock is now goose non grata and is shunned by his siblings. <laughs> He takes to the water to consider his position while Gavin Shire, Airlie's lead biologist, observes his relationship to the swans. Joe and I spend a week planning the next 400 mile leg to the Tom Yawkey Wildlife Center in South Carolina. By late November, we leave early and set course for the Carolinas. Again, the birds will not climb. At one point, they follow a flight of wild geese in for an unscheduled landing right at a horse farm owned by Miss Peggy Augustus. And it takes a little explaining on our part.
There is another stop at the Lotus Shrine of Swami Satchidananda on the James River. We land on the date of the Swami's 80th birthday. The geese are quite curious about the shrine and spend the day exploring. Just as he was landing here, Joe's engine had quit. So he unloads his motorcycle and heads out in search of new spark plugs. The next morning we jump started and after removing a layer of frost from the wings, we were headed south again. Virginia is a big state when you have a consistent headwind. Our ground speed is seldom more than 20 miles an hour. Sometimes we feel we could walk the route faster. At this stop near the village of Clover, Jordy and Kirk spend the day relating to the geese. Turn to me. Oh, that's great. Oh. That's great. This little bear. <laughs> With bad weather forecast for the next day, toward evening we fly the, another 10 miles on to land at Big River, where Jim and Sandy Compton put us up in relative luxury, even a hangar for the aircraft. Jim is a retired crop duster pilot and regales us with many an aviation tale. He tells us the pilot's worst two enemies are ground fog and dirty fuel. Three days later, at a stop in North Carolina, Kirk and Geordie set up the pens, while David Woodhouse, the most experienced ultralight flyer of the crew, puts his expertise to use and helps Joe sort out a persistent imbalance with his wing. Before the sun has risen the next day, we hustle to get airborne. There are patches of ground mist, and we think of Jim Compton's warning, but it still looks thin enough to proceed. fog thickens, so much that for a time we lose sight of the ground. Even the video camera ceases to work. It's a frightening time. Our guardian angels are with us, and the only clear patch for miles reveals a brand new airstrip, a gift that we take advantage of. Later in the day, we're able to proceed stopping overnight at the home of the Wallaces near Aberdeen, North Carolina, where they treat us to a feast of barbecued oysters. Two more stops and a long, grisly run over the great P.D. Swamp finally bring us to the Tom Yogi Center a full 10 days after we've left early. Dr. Slayton has driven the route and is there to welcome us. And furthermore, Igor has flown the whole route. 
This one is Igor. He was the first one. He was the dominant bird, and the first one that fell out of migration uh, from Ontario. And yeah, in fact, it's about time they lost some weight. Yeah, we can actually stop the horn right now. Mm. No, we should. It's very important to have, have a little <laughs> beguiling. Uh, Bob Joyner, a resident biologist at the Tom Yaki Center, tells us in on the history and conducts us on a tour of the 20,000 acre preserve. It's fascinating to us Canadians more used to the northerly landscapes. The geese are penned in an area appropriately called the goose pasture. Three days later, leaving Kirk in charge, the geese are released to explore on their own while we all head back to Canada for the Christmas season. A week later, the geese disappear completely from the Yaki Center, and despite a concerted effort in the Carolinas, there's not a feather of evidence of their existence, except for one goose found near Myrtle Beach on New Year's Day. The next spring, we return to pick up our aircraft and sadly, we head home, contemplating their demise the whole way. We arrive back in Ontario in early April, and the birds are forgotten. Then, April 19th, big surprise. Five months after we left them in South Carolina, we get a call from a wildlife officer in Niagara Falls. Igor has been sighted in a park. And before the elation has a moment to subside, we get a call from the sod farm. 28 of our geese with some wild ones have returned. And the next day, Igor too arrives at the sod farm along with three wild females. He just stopped by the falls on the way home. We're totally elated. Twice now, the aircraft led migration has worked. In the spring of 95, a total of 33 geese of the 36 that flew south had returned. We contemplate our next project. Well, as most people know, Canada geese aren't threatened or endangered, but we had learned a lot from them. We felt now we were much closer to trying this experiment with the bird most in need, the hooping crane. So in 1995, as an interim experiment, we raised a flock of sandhill cranes. Again, not an endangered bird, but a close cousin to the hooper. In 1995, while most of our time is taken up with helping Columbia Pictures and Carol Ballard produce the film Fly Away Home, we raise a small group of sandhill cranes in an attempt to have them follow the aircraft like the geese. Our experiment is successful, and although the cranes are more difficult to raise, they soon become expert at flying with the ultralight. But it is this bird, the hooping crane, that we wish to help. It once inhabited most of North America, but now there are only a few left. Joe explains what we hope to do. There's only one wild migratory flock of whooping cranes left. They nest at Wood Buffalo National Park in the Northwest Territories of Canada, and they travel 2,500 miles to the Gulf Coast of Texas. What we would like to do is work with the whooping crane recovery team to establish a second flock. We'd introduce them in Prairie, Canada, and hopefully lead them with ultralight airplanes all the way to the southeastern United States. Yes, the new dream is to help establish this secondary flock of migratory hoopers, to hopefully help ensure their survival forever. And we also wish to pass on what we have learned to others around the world who are working to save endangered migratory birds.
As a footnote, by November of 1996, two of the ultra geese that had come back to Ontario were observed again back in the Carolinas, having flown south on their second season. We believe the rest are also returning south, but with no effective way of tracking them, we have to rely on the public for information as to their whereabouts. To that end, as you have seen in this documentary, all of the ultra geese wear yellow striped grey neckbands starting with the letter K. And there is an 800 number at the end of this program. We would greatly appreciate any reports on sightings of the ultra geese.